Hello, my name is Sarah Dietrich. And before I go any further, I feel like I need to tell you something. I'm not an expert, but luckily, I'm not giving you a talk today about expertise. I am going to talk to you about creativity. I'm going to share with you the creative power of not being an expert. To become an expert, a person has to spend a very long time working in a very specific area. If you think of expertise like building a tool, the expert has spent countless hours learning everything there is to know about that tool. And then they have built the strongest, fastest, best version of that tool. And if you go to that expert with a problem and you say, what do you recommend I do? Well, it's likely that they're going to recommend that you use that tool. After all, that's what they know. To become an expert, you have to be a specialist. Our education system, it's shaped like a pyramid. And at the top, we have the special, the special expert. In middle school and elementary school, we build a broad foundation, which we narrow in high school as we pick our electives and our AP classes. In college, we're told to focus on a major, and in graduate school, they refine us to a point, telling us to focus on the most specific area within a particular discipline, a pinprick of knowledge. When I talk to you about an expert, when you go to your family doctor, that's a generalist. The expert is the specialist that you get sent to. They don't just focus on sinuses. They focus on a specific area within sinuses, one particular problem. That is the specialist expert. Middle school was the first time that I remember someone actively pushing me to specialize. In band, we learned about trumpets and trombones, clarinets, saxophones. Most students, they naturally gravitated to one instrument. But I was interested in learning the clarinet and the drums and the saxophone. My parents said we were absolutely not having the drums in our house. So I revised. And I said, OK. I went to my band instructor. I want to play the clarinet, the saxophone, and the bass clarinet. And what he said to me was a sentiment that I would hear over and over again. He looked at me and he said, it's better to be good at one thing than a jack of all trades and a master of none. Living in a culture that emphasizes focused knowledge, broad, unfocused interests can be actively or passively discouraged. But there is another option from specializing. Throughout history, we have been called the Renaissance men, the polymaths, the multipotentialites, the universal men or simply the generalists. We include the great thinkers like Thomas Jefferson, Da Vinci, and Steve Jobs. We have been the creators, the innovators, the inventors. So today, I'm going to tell you three ways that the generalist rises above the expert with our creative powers. First, experts, they're like islands. And the generalist, we build bridges between these islands. After I graduated college with my bachelor's degree in psychology, I stepped out into the professional animal training world, learning how to train dogs and dolphins. And I actually stepped, without knowing it, onto my first island. This was the island of the reinforcement-based trainers. Like me, most of these trainers had college degrees. We spoke the jargon of academic psychology. But that wasn't the only island. Next to our island, there was another island, and it was right next door, but no one was going over there. I looked over, and what I saw were amazing dogs. These were the working dog trainers. Their dogs were sniffing for bombs with TSA, serving with our military and our police. Their knowledge, it wasn't in any of the books. The only way that I could learn from them was to go work with them, so that's what I did. I stepped onto that island, and I said, I want to train with you. These trainers, they didn't necessarily have college degrees. They had no fancy jargon. 
They had learned on the job, they had learned from friends and neighbors and workshops and through sheer hours perfecting their craft. I would go back and forth between these islands, bringing the skills I'd learned from one to the other, and they would look at me funny because that wasn't their culture and I wasn't speaking their jargon anymore. Then we came upon a project where we wanted to see if dogs could sniff out epilepsy. Well, we needed the skills from these different islands. So I called out to my brave ambassadors and I said, I need your help on this project. We pulled together a reinforcement-based trainer from the dolphin world. We pulled in an academic research psychologist and a working dog trainer who specialized in odor detection. We had a project and we had all the experts. Now, what was I doing there? Partially, I was the generalist who had built the bridges to bring these people together. I also knew just enough about each discipline to know what it is they could contribute and to translate between them. I've since completed that project. But the bridges that I built, those lines of communication are still open. Every year, that detection dog trainer comes over to the college and he teaches the undergraduate psychology students about working dog training. And he has picked up some of the ac academic jargon. I'll still get text messages. What would you guys use to refer to this? If we leave our experts alone, they will just build bigger islands. We need our generalists to go between those islands and build bridges. Next, experts, they're like a hammer. Generalists, were like Swiss Army knives. As we go between these islands, we don't just build bridges, but we pick up tools from each island that we visited. Instead of one nearly perfected tool, we have an entire toolbox. So when you come to a generalist with a problem, let's say that this generalist only has two tools. Well, we could suggest that you use one tool or the other, or we can do two different combinations of those tools. That is four possible solutions, three more than the expert, just because I had one more tool. And as we have generalists with toolbox of five, 10, 20, or 100 different tools, we have an absolute explosion of different combinations. I left animal training and I went to graduate school where I studied communication, I studied how people communicate, but not just that. I focused specifically on how people lie. My research trail, it reflects the novel combinations that I can put my experiences together. On one project, we were focusing on how dolphins understand other people's minds, something called theory of mind. And we were working in the behaviorist tradition. But I was coming to this project with an animal training background. I was able to design the training plan. And then I was able to look at past studies and say, your training plan, it really limits your research results. Because the trainer, they don't usually understand the study. And the researcher, they're not there every day watching the training. But it wasn't only that, I brought even more shades to this project. Because I could look and I could see how the dolphin's misbehavior was telling us just as much as the study we were trying to do because I was coming at it with this background in deception. These combinations, these are what give the generalist their power. Number three, generalists, we make better novices. After all, each time we go into a new field, we don't know anything about it. We have no ego. We know how to learn. Many areas, they're easy to learn, but difficult to master. What this means is if we take the expert's entire life of learning and we put it into a model of five hours. They've spent all five hours becoming an expert at this one thing. In half that time, they had a pretty advanced understanding, but they had to spend the rest of it to become an expert. In that same amount of time, a generalist can get a pretty advanced understanding of four different fields without going that extra effort toward expertise. When I came out of graduate school, I had experience as an animal trainer, I had experience as a researcher, 
but I decided to take an entry-level job at NASA, working with the Network Operations Group for the Earth-observing satellites. There were a lot of jokes about the dolphin trainer who came to work at NASA. A couple of the engineers thought that I was secretly sent there to train them, and my friends asked if I was studying the quirky behavior of engineers. But between all of these jokes, they noticed something else. I picked things up relatively quickly. Every day, I encountered things that I knew absolutely nothing about. But that's fine. I've encountered things I don't know anything about all the time. I know how to say, I don't know, but I'll look that up and get back to you. Because novices, we know how to learn. Experts look at the same problem over and over again, and they're bringing all of their past knowledge, but they're looking at it through the same lens. Coming in, I had no idea what was going on. So, through sheer necessity, I need to bring a fresh perspective. As Grace Hopper would say, the most dangerous phrase is, well, we've always done it that way. If you bring a novice to a problem, they're going to do it a different way. Something else happened. When new technology came to the team, the experts and the novices, we quickly found ourselves on near equal footing. I'm not saying that we should build an entire team of novices. That would be a terrible idea. But on a team of experts, if you add a few novices, we can inject that creativity. I've shared these thoughts with people before, and they usually say, yep, Sarah, you're right. Having a broad understanding, that's generally a good idea, but sometimes things are just too unrelated. Those are never going to help someone out. We've all heard about this idea of six degrees of separation between people. The idea that between me and absolutely anyone else in the world, there's only six hops. If you find someone I know and then find someone they know, you do it six times, you'll get to anyone else. Well, I see that same thing with knowledge. Except it's not six hops. It's usually just one or two hops before even the most disparate fields begin to converge. Whether it's dolphin training to artificial intelligence or academic psychology research to network operations. For example, one of the cutting edge things in artificial intelligence right now is models that learn through reinforcement. People are worried that they're going to become evil or selfish. Well, Reinforcement-based learning, every animal trainer knows about reinforcement-based learning. Every psychologist knows about it. We understand how it shapes our everyday life, and we can come to that problem and offer solutions and translate what that really means. And when I came to the network operations team, what I saw was data. Lots and lots and lots of log data. Well, I was a researcher. That's what I did. I used to bring in data. I would clean it and manipulate it and look for patterns and translate it to find conclusions. I could bring all of those tools and put them into the network operations. So what I want to leave you with is this. Our generalists, they give us creative power. If you're someone who is already on the specialist path and you are drawn to that, what I say is don't forget those hobbies that are seemingly unrelated. Don't neglect them and let them grow dust. Keep them with you. And if you find yourself naturally a generalist with wide interests, don't feel the pressure to lock down and forget everything else you're interested in. We need you. As a society, we need our generalists to build bridges between knowledge. We need them to create novel combinations as they hop from job to job. We need them to be our frontiers, our novices at the end of knowledge, and we need them to bring in creativity to old problems. Thank you.